So let me let me just um, quickly introduce kind of the deck that I'm pulling these slides from. At J.P. Morgan, we are a research shop. We spend more money a year on research than any other asset manager globally. A lot of our competitors buy research from us, and effectively, we take a lot of the data that we gather and we put it into a usable format. And there's a deck that we have here called the Guide to the Markets, where we put a lot of the slides that we're using in conversations on a daily basis in place and we update it daily online. And effectively, we purposely don't include any commentary on these slides. This is just data, it's open for interpretation. And I'm gonna go through and share with you how we're looking at some of uh, the data on these slides and putting it into context in, in terms of where we are today. So let's start with where we're at in general. And I just made a comment about kind of these markets and it reminds me of a oft used Yogi Berra phrase, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. I'm sure that's how everybody's feeling and change is occurring rapidly in this environment and has really since the beginning of the pandemic. And so we've, we've needed to adapt quite consistently through these past couple of years. And just as, as we're entering the point where we think we're coming out of the pandemic, we're hit with all of these other issues like inflation and things of that nature that we're gonna talk about today. I do wanna remind people though that change is constant. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, when I was growing up, you had just kind of truisms. I mean, just common wisdom, if you will, things as simple and things that I teach my kids today. I've got the, the uh, five and the eight year old, never get into the car of a stranger, someone you don't know. I try to teach them, obviously, don't ever get into a car of somebody you don't know. Come tell mom, dad, or a, a figure of authority. Another truism, I think everybody would agree, who's grown up kind of in the internet era, is uh, never meet someone in person you've only ever spoken to on the internet. I think these are just common sense statements, but fast forward to where we are today, and you literally have millions of people getting into the cars of people they've never seen met before, whom they've only interacted with by summing them on the internet. It's called Uber. And so we have adapted, we've changed dramatically our society, how we live, what we're willing to accept. And I want you guys to keep an open mind in terms of what we should think about in terms of markets and how they behave and what we're gonna experience uh, currently and going forward. So what you're looking at here, let me just orient you to this chart. This is a chart of the S&P 500, which is basically a broad index of stocks. So it's 500 stocks in the US that represent our stock market and uh, our economy, so to speak. And the gray bars are simply the, year to, the annual year return. If it's pointing up, and for example, 1980, the very first says 26%. That means there was a 26% return, not including the dividend. You can add about 2% for dividends to each of these numbers for the, the calendar year 1980 for the S&P 500, the US stock market. The little red dot with a negative number below it simply represents what was the market's highest point to lowest point that year. Because the market never goes up in a straight line. It goes up, it comes down, it goes up again, it comes down. And we want to measure what was its peak to trough decline. And the first thing I ask people to do in looking at this chart is say, show me the year that doesn't have a little red dot with a negative number. It doesn't exist. We always have pullbacks and they occur frequently. I know that this is a year that has felt very uncomfortable in the market. If you look at where we are on the opposite end of this chart, year to date, it shows you down 23%, and its worst drawdown was 24% a couple days ago. While it doesn't feel good to be down this much, and we haven't had a down year like this since 2020 when we saw the market go down 34%, and then since 2008 when we saw anything close to where we are, it's not abnormal. And what I mean by that is as I, hope to highlight during this chart, markets go up and down intra year. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the beginning of the S&P 500 to 1928, 
That's 90 years of history. In that 90 years, 60 of them, two thirds, the market was down, double digits. And of those years, the down period averaged about 16%, which is not dramatically better than where we are today. But you may be sitting there saying, well, 16% sounds a lot better than 24, 23, and you're right. So let's examine then how many times have we seen since World War II what we call a bear market, meaning the market going down 20% or more. It's happened every 5.86 years. Now, to me, again, that's the difference between it being abnormal and bring, being unusual. It doesn't happen on a regular occurrence, meaning every one or two years, but happening every 5.8, let's even call it six years, does not make it abnormal. I would say that almost makes it frequent. And so with that being said, we shouldn't be worried simply about the absolute return of the overall market. We've seen this plenty of times before. So we kind of need to take a step back and examine a little more of what's going on to determine, okay, is this a point in which I should make a change in my investment plan? Is this an opportunity? We want to examine those. and We'll get to that in a moment. One thing that is historically unusual, however, is just the ride that we experienced this year. The market being down 24%, as I pointed out, is not unusual, but it being down consistently month after month, the slow bleed, that is very unusual. You actually have to go back to 1939 to find the last time the market was down more than we are today, this many trading days into the year in this slow bleed pattern. And it only actually occurred even worse than that one other time, and that was 1932. So this is kind of the third worst year on record to have this pattern of being a slow bleed, but the absolute return number being down 23, 24% is not highly unusual. So we know that that made us psychologically feel worse about being that, that slow grind. It's not fun. But it wasn't just stocks that were giving us this, this feeling about this year. It's also bonds. And so this is a chart very much like the last one, but looking at the bond market. So there's a, a bond index called the Bloomberg US Aggregate Index. It's been around since 1976. And what I hope you'll notice is that there's also a red dot and negative number associated with them they're just not nearly as large as those of the stock market. So the bond market we know has less volatility. And you can see that bonds finish positive more so than stocks. But even back on this first chart, since 1980, you're still seeing a positive return 80% of the years represented on this chart, which is very good odds if you're a stock investor and why you want to continue to invest for the long term, as one out of five years may finish negative, but four out of those five, or the overwhelming majority, are going to finish positive, and you're going to grow wealth, which is why we invest. We invest in bonds because they do offer us an even safer return. The returns are not going to be as attractive over time, especially over the last decade. And we don't necessarily believe that over this next decade, they're going to be dramatically higher, but we'll get to that in a moment. But we know that they offer more positive returns on an annual basis than stocks do. And we want to have a healthy mix of both stocks and bonds in our portfolio for diversification purposes. But this has been an odd year, and people think there must be something wrong if both stocks and bonds are going down. And that's simply not true. If you notice on this chart, there are four years prior to the one we're in currently where the bond market did finish the calendar year down, reflected in the gray bars. Now, year to date, it's saying only down six. This was only through the end of the quarter. That's the last time we updated this chart. It's actually down uh, more like 10% or a little over 10 today, so much worse. However, you can see that this so far on a year to date basis, if we ended the year today, would be the absolute worst performance for this bond index on record. If you go to 1980, you saw at one point it was down 7% before finishing positive. I would submit that the bond market will finish better by the end of the year than it is today. We'll talk about why that is in a moment, but it may not get all the way back to even or positive 
in the environment we're in simply because it's such a low interest rate environment. But I do want to remind everybody that stocks and bonds going down at the same time is not abnormal. As a matter of fact, it's happened three different occasions over the last decade. In 2013, in 2015, and in 2018, you saw both stocks and bonds at one point in the year go down at the same time. What do all those years, including the one we're in, have in common? Well, that's when interest rates were moving higher. Anytime you have interest rates moving higher, that's going to be negative for bonds. It will send bond prices lower. But at times, interest rates going higher also signals fear for the stock market. The stock market will also correct. The difference between this year and those other three years is that we weren't combating inflation like we haven't seen for 40 years. And so when the Fed started talking about raising rates, they didn't even have to actually do it. The market started doing it for them. And you saw that negative response in both stocks and bonds. Well, this time around, the Fed is actually raising interest rates. And anytime you have the Fed raising rates on the initial part of the cycle, both stocks and bonds traditionally go down. The difference this year is that we had to be more aggressive about raising those rates. And they did it in a shorter period of time. And so that didn't give a lot of opportunity for people to digest info, and they just decided to sell on both the stock side as well as the bond side. As a matter of fact, if you look at the fact that you saw both stocks and bonds going down three months consecutively together, that is unusual. It doesn't frequently occur. Those other occurrences I've mentioned over the last decade, 2013, 2015, and 2018, both stocks and bonds went down together, but only up to about a couple months did it occur where both of them went down uh, for each of those months. You have to go back to 1976 to find the last time that both stocks and bonds were down three months in a row or more. And that has everything to do with the fact that we poured $9 trillion worth of stimulus on the economy, and now we're seeing inflation because of it. It's not nefarious. There's nothing broken or wrong. It's simply we're coming out of the pandemic and people have excess cash to spend, and we're a nation of consumers. Just ask my wife. So if you look at the inflationary component, let's talk about what our anticipation is, because this is where people really, I think, uh, can become mired in fear. Number one, a lot of what we're dealing with today has to do with a culmination of a couple different events. It's just not one thing. But we still submit that these events will resolve themselves and you will have inflation come back down again. Nobody can tell you with certainty how long it's going to take. However, it will come down. And if you look at the components that we're looking at here, we've kind of broken this up in that last bar of what is what we call transitory or what we think is temporary and what we think is more sticky. So let's first take a step back. You'll notice that going back to March of 2021, we've seen this steady increase. And that has everything to do with what I was talking about before, the stimulus that we all received from the pandemic. But if you had this chart drawn way back to 2008, what you would find is that inflation was almost non-existent. It averaged about 1.8%. As a matter of fact, the Fed was fearful and tried to spur inflation. They wanted to create it, and they couldn't do it to save their life. Now they have the opposite end of the problem. And what's tricky about this environment is we know with the war going on in the Ukraine and Russia conflict, you have impacted global markets in a way that the Fed can't affect. The Fed's job is to try to manage inflation and maintain full employment. They do that with only a handful of tools. 
One of them is the one we're talking about, the monetary tool. They, they have the ability to raise interest rates on the short end of the curve. And the intent of doing that is not only to make it more expensive for businesses or investors trying to use leverage and borrow to spend more, but they're also sending a signal to consumers saying, hey, you might want to think about that next major purchase because we are intent on raising rates to slow the economy down. That's exactly what they're intending to do by raising rates is slow things down so we don't have a worse bubble or a worse inflationary environment. But no amount of raising rates is going to stop prices going up at the pump or prices going up at the grocery store. That has everything to do with shortages because of the conflict in Europe. We're confident that by the end of the year, you're going to see some reprieve in those areas as the world is constantly looking to be efficient. We are starting to drill more. Other nations are going to bring more crude to market. We're going to grow new food stores in different areas, and we'll try to accommodate as best possible because higher prices attract new investors and attract new entrants into the market to take advantage of that. It's just going to take some time. But there are parts of the inflationary picture that are going to be more sticky. For example, housing. Houses themselves are not in the CPI basket. And, and I failed to mention, this bar represents that quote unquote CPI basket. What is measured when we measure inflation? And you can see it's made up of these color-coded concepts here. Shelter is what we call housing. It's not actually house prices. It's what we call owner's equivalent rent. And the reason being, not everybody's in the market for a house. As a matter of fact, a small percentage of the public at any given time is actually buying a home. And so that's not inflation felt by everybody. And they're trying to measure, measure as best they can inflation felt by everybody. But what do higher prices lead to? Higher rents. Everybody either pays a mortgage or pays rent. And higher prices and higher interest rates also lead to higher mortgage payments. So there's a lag effect in the shelter component, and we think that's gonna to continue to go up for some time to come. But there's other areas where we do expect and have already seen prices come down. Another major component in the basket is autos. We've seen used auto prices skyrocket. In 2021, used autos were up 50%. Now, I know that a lot of people were not willing to take public transportation during the pandemic and went out and bought cars. It was also exacerbated because they couldn't produce enough new cars because there weren't enough semiconductor chips. We started to see the resolution. You're seeing new mark, pardon me, more new cars on market, and you're starting to see people use public transportation again. And that's why every month this year, except the first month, the used car market has come down. So that's actually deflationary. So that's going to subtract from inflation going forward. And so you constantly have moving targets. And that's why it caught people by surprise in May that inflation jumped back up after going down in April from its peak in March. And we're telling people, buckle in for a bumpy ride over the summer because we think we're going to see this kind of float near the top. We think we're around peak inflation. But we do expect this 8.6 number to be closer to 5% by the end of the year, if not less. And going into 2023, by the end of the year, we expect that number to be 4%, if not less. And by the end of year 2024, we expect it to be closer to its longer term trajectory of around 2.5%. And that's suggesting we're not having a recession. If we have a recession, you can expect these numbers to come down more quickly because recessions always bring in deflation. Why do we not expect that we're gonna see an inflationary spiral like the 70s? The fact of the matter is the 70s were a very different economy in a very different environment than the one we're in today. As a matter of fact, just by looking at demographics, like the number of workers alone, you get a sense of how different they are. Today, we have an unemployment that's historically low and we have 11 and a half million job openings, the most we've ever seen in this country. In the 70s, you had a different problem. You had 
new workers entering the workplace every single year. The reason we have such a gap between available workers and jobs today is because we have a shrinking number of workers available. Our labor pool has been shrinking every year for several years. This has nothing to do with the pandemic or anything recently. We're just becoming an older economy. It's what happens. Look at Japan. Japan sells more baby diapers, or pardon me, adult diapers than they do baby diapers. We don't want to become like Japan, which is why it's healthy to have a lawful immigration program. But we need to be concerned with having available workers. But from an inflationary standpoint, that is actually deflationary over time. If you look at what happened in the 70s, you had more workers enter into the marketplace every year, which means more and more people chasing goods, more and more people making more and more money because labor unions were prolific. We don't have them really anymore. If labor unions were successful at increasing wages because you had interest rates going up, you had some inflation grabbing hold, that actually made a, a negative inflationary spiral, what we call a price, a wage price spiral take place where wages kept going up to combat inflation, but that only made inflation worse because the more you pay people and the more people you put into the market making more money, the more they were willing to pay for goods and the more the goods cost. That's not at all what we have in this environment. We have too few workers and necessarily at some point, you're going to see that catch up take place after all of the extra cash that's on consumer balance sheets subsides. It's just going to take some time for that to, to happen. I didn't mean to spend that much time just on inflation, but I know that's a point that a lot of people are stuck on. And so I wanted to say that before opening it to questions, but I'm going to move through some of these other slides a little quicker. So what is the Fed doing about inflation? We talked about it. They're raising interest rates. They're doing that to signal hey, we're trying to slow the economy down. Think about the purchases you're making. Well, as I made a comment before, the American public loves to consume. And if you look at gas prices today, this is case in point. Everybody is complaining about gas prices. But guess what? Nobody's not buying gas. As a matter of fact, we saw consumption increase again. And so effectively, people are complaining about it, but they're still spending it. As long as they have the money to spend, they'll spend. So what we're looking at now is the Fed saying, OK, we get that there's a lot of dry powder buying power by the public. We're going to have to raise our estimates to where we think we have to go with short term rates in order to cool things off. Because just a month ago, this chart measured 2.8 percent in the blue dots across the board. Those blue dots are representing what does the Fed think it needs to do with interest rates to have the impact that it wants to have. Well, they adjusted upward from 2.8 to 3.4. That's why you saw another leg down recently in the market, because the stock market's going to adjust to interest rates. If you have higher interest rates, you're not willing to pay as much for stocks. I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's the mechanism by which the market is repricing and readjusting based on what they anticipate rates are going to do. Notice, though, this little purple dot that says 2.5 in the right corner. That's what the Fed itself believes long term rates are going to be over the next decade. So they anticipate they're going to have to push them up higher than they need to be before bringing them back down. If I went back to that chart with bonds, what you would see is a pattern. Anytime you had these negative years where the bond market finished down, look at the year following. It usually does better than average, or at least those recent averages. And we would expect this time to be similar. If the Fed overshoots, as we think they're likely to do, as they have done consistently throughout history, then they tend to have to correct on the other side. And if interest rates go lower, the price of your bonds are worth more. We'll cover a little more about that in a moment. But suffice it to say, we don't disagree with the Fed. We think long-term rates are going to be very consistent, but slightly higher than what we expected over the last decade. And necessarily, we think inflation, as I mentioned, is going to be consistent, but slightly higher than what we experienced over the last decade. If it was 1.8 over the last decade, 
We expect it to be less than two and a half over the next decade. We just have to weather this storm first. So let me talk about uh, recessions. The other most commonly asked concept is recessions. And do we think we're going into one? The short answer is yes, we are going into a recession. When it happens, I have no idea. Is it gonna happen this year? Likely not, but we always have recessions. It's part of the business cycle. If we didn't just have the longest expansion in US history, and we didn't have the last two real recessions, I'm not talking about what happened to the pandemic, that's unique, but I'm talking the financial crisis of 2008, and then the dot-com bubble bursting back in 2000, 2001, and then of course 9-11 occurring right after that. So you had an exacerbated recession and downturn in both of those scenarios because in the financial crisis, you had 100-year-old financial firms going out of business. There's nothing like that taking place today. The economy fundamentally is still very strong. In the dot-com era, we had companies like pet.com just basically file for to become a public company and, and people just threw money at it, expecting anything to do with the internet was, was gonna be gold. And we learned later that wasn't the case. And so while we had some high PEs this time around, it was nothing compared to what we saw back then. And we saw the market correct uh, and correctly so. And so why don't we think we're gonna go into recession in 2021? Well, the fact of the matter is, you have a couple things that are still in place to keep the party going. Number one, we're still a nation of consumers and consumption is what drives our economy. Two thirds of our, company, our, of our economy is strictly consumption, what we all do on a daily basis. And the consumer balance sheet that I'm showing you here reflects how strong it is. We still have one of the strongest consumers in history. And I would submit to you, if we went into recession this year, that would be abnormal. We've never gone into a recession when consumer balance sheets have been as strong as they are today. We still have excess cash. And I'm not talking a little bit, I'm talking about trillions of dollars sitting on the balance sheets of consumers that was in addition to what it was before the pandemic. So that's still the dry powder I was talking about that can get spent before we start to see things really calm down. You also have a scenario over the last 14 years where the federal government decided, hey, we're gonna take debt onto our balance sheet so we can allow consumers to get out of it. And that's where they lowered interest rates to zero and flooded the market with liquidity. We called it quantitative easing. And you see in the top right corner, this chart shows that. What percentage of your income has to go towards servicing debt is very, very low compared to history. Now, it's true, the savings rate has come down to pre-pandemic levels. People aren't saving like they did during the pandemic, but it doesn't mean they still don't have more money on their balance sheet than they did before. And it's gonna take a little while to play out. The second component is businesses. Businesses are also extremely flush with cash. As a matter of fact, there is more cash on corporate balance sheets today than there are than there is debt. We haven't seen that in over 30 years. Corporate earnings are also strong. If you look at the right-hand side of this chart, you'll see three different lines. The gray one pointing up, that is real earnings year to date. Companies are making money and they're continuing to do so because guess what? Consumption has continued to take place all year long. But what you see in the bottom, in the blue line, is what we call multiple growth. That just means how much are we as investors willing to pay for a dollar's worth of earnings in the market? When we get, when we get fearful, we think there's gonna be a recession, or we say, oh man, all these big high-flying tech stocks that have big PEs aren't worth this anymore. If interest rates and inflation are gonna be higher, we're willing to sell and start taking profits, then necessarily you have the green line, which represents the S&P 500 prices, the stock market prices, which is simply a function of what are earnings and what are multiples. If people are just selling, 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 no matter what earnings do, well, the earnings can't keep up with that selling pressure and that's caused the market to go down. But we anticipate, unless we do go into recession, that earnings are gonna remain positive. And we're gonna come back to that point in a minute, 
because where we are in the market is suggesting that may not be the case. And that's one of the things you want to look for to see if we're in a environment that may be an attractive entry point to go into the market. So we think corporate earnings are going to remain resilient and positive. And as a matter of fact, nobody's lowered their earnings estimates for this calendar year. No major firm, not JP Morgan, not any of our competitors. As a matter of fact, we already raised it once. Now I anticipate going on into the year that will happen, but we're still gonna have positive earnings for this calendar year, which is not at all reflected in the price of stocks today. If you look at that multiple number over time, what you see here is a chart going back 25 years. This is not the S&P price return. This is simply that S&P index, the stock index from a valuation standpoint. And again, what is the multiple? Let me explain real quick. It's just P over E, meaning what is the price of the stock over its earnings? And that calculation gives you this number, 15.81. If you added all the prices of all the stocks in the S&P 500 on top in that numerator, and then the denominator is all the earnings of all those companies in the S&P 500, you simply do that calculation and you get 15.81. And you can see it's lower than it has been over the last decade most of the time and certainly lower than that 25 year average. So we're getting to the point where we're seeing real attractiveness in the market for the first time in a very long time. Because remember coming into this year, that price to earnings multiple number was closer to 23. So if we know that stocks are attractively priced and not really reflecting the earnings that we're still garnering in those stocks, how else should we think about whether it might be a good time to buy or not? I think if you look at how we feel, this is a direct correlation to what we might want to do. This is a chart that's called the, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. They've been taking this survey for quite some time. And as you can see, what it's measuring here is whether people feel good about the economy and the markets, or they feel bad. And what we've done was we said, okay, well, let's go in and look at each of these inflection points at the very top. So you see above the dotted line, you'll see these blue points of time. We give you a date and we give you a little number. And it says, okay, if we're feeling really awesome about things, let's mark that peak in time and say, what did the market do 12 months after? Not prior, but after. So for example, in March of 1984, it said that if you took a snapshot and you looked out 12 and you invested money today, 12 months later, the market was up 13 and a half percent. But look at 1972, it would have been down 6.2. Look at in 77, only positive 1.2. If you look at these other numbers, again, very low numbers across the board. Now, the exception of course, was February of 2020. And that was because we did an unprecedented thing by shutting the economy down and just flooding consumers and the market with money. But even if you include that 29%, if you look and add all these points together and you only invested when you felt good about things, your average return was 4.1% one year out. Conversely, what if we invested when we felt bad, when we thought, this is it, it can't get worse than this, I'm going to sell all my investments. What if instead we bought when we felt things were at their worst? You add these bottom numbers up, and it's a very different story. The market is up on average 25% 12 months later. And as a matter of fact, at each of these inflection points, 1975, 1980, 1990, 2008, 2011, they're all double digits and most of them significantly double digits. And of course, most recently, April, 2020. But I want you to pay particular attention to where we are today, June of 2022. We are now lower than any point since the University of Michigan 
has been keeping the survey going. Does it feel to you when you walk out the door and you go to grab something to eat or you go to the grocery store or you go anywhere that we're in a recession? I think you have to start to think about things in terms of how much influence the social media and the financial media on TV play by telling you what you're supposed to think versus what you're out there witnessing. At the end of the day, it's the media's job to sell advertising. And they know that fear is felt twice as powerfully as greed. As a matter of fact, that was proven. The guy who won the Nobel Prize in economics back in 2002 was a gentleman by the name of Daniel Kahneman. He wasn't even an economist. He was a psychologist and he won the Nobel Prize in economics proving through a series of different experiments that people feel fear twice as powerfully as they do euphoria or gain. But we innately know that. And it's why when you watch the financial media, they never use words like the market's up or down. It's always the market's plummeting or the market's soaring or, or something dramatic. If you got onto an elevator and the only two options were plummet or soar, you'd likely get off. And that's the intent is to give you kind of that feeling. And so necessarily we want to keep that in mind. So just know the best times to invest are usually when we're feeling at our worst. Secondly, let's look at where we are today and just look at market history and say, okay, what would it take in order for us just to get back to even? And by the way, if you look at the number of months in which it takes for the market to hit its trough, which I'm not suggesting that we're in, it could certainly go lower from here, but let's just assume that we did hit it. Typically, it takes about 10 months, which it hasn't been peak to trough. But typically, it takes about two years to just get back to break even. And so effectively on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a chart giving you what your return would be just to get back to even. So if the average is two years, then you would actually be making 14.8% a year over the next two years, which is a pretty attractive return and much higher than long-term average. As a matter of fact, let's say it took four years. You're still talking about an 8% annualized return that doesn't include dividends. You could add about 2% for that to that for dividends. And so you see that the return scenario becomes much more attractive going forward the deeper the market trough goes. It doesn't feel good on the way down, but that's why we advocate taking advantage of lower prices. If you are in the phase of your life where you're still accumulating for retirement, this is especially true because people look at it wrong. They look at their statement and they want to see what is the dollar value of my statement. Instead, they should look at their statement and say, how do I figure out how many shares I own of everything I own? You want to see that number grow as fast as you possibly can. You don't want, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive, but as you're saving for retirement, you actually don't want higher prices every single day because that just means your return potential is going to be lower over time if you're always having to pay a higher price every time you buy. If you think about it innately, you want to be able to buy some shares at lower prices so when you need them, and the market does go up, you're going to actually have even more money. That's actually how compound interest over time works. And so we want to take advantage of these opportunities to buy more shares at a lower price because we accumulate more shares with the same number of dollars than we did in the recent past before that. And so at the end of the day, we don't know where the bottom's going to be. But we do know this. History often rhymes. And if you look at history, the, the right side of this chart doesn't show this. It shows something else. This is all bear markets. But if you look at just the bear markets that are associated 
or pardon me, not even bear markets. Bear market implies a 20% return. If you go back and you look at all market downturns that are associated with a recession since World War II, the average decline is 24%. Because believe it or not, there are recessions on record, plenty of them, where the market didn't even go down 20%. But because it hasn't happened in so long, we naturally always associate a recession with a very deep market move. That's actually the exception, not the rule. So if we go back and we say, okay, if we know that the average downturn associated with a recession is down 24%, and we also know that the market typically bottoms before we go into recession or come out of the recession. The market is an anticipation machine. It's always looking forward. Usually by the time we figure out, which is always in hindsight, that we were in a recession, we only know that by confirmation of the economic data, the market's already started its recovery phase. So before, if you're starting to have anxiety and think about doing something like selling today, just remember, all that's happened is the change of the price on paper. You don't actually realize a loss until you sell something. And then you start the concept or cycle of trying to compound interest over time and all over again. And it's nearly impossible to ever recoup what you've just stopped. And so we want to consider we've already been through the majority of the pain as associated with other recessions if you're convinced we're going into one. It's likely we will see one within the next three years, but we can't time that. And we certainly know that the market is going to give us many varied opportunities for returns before that happens and certainly before it finishes. So if those two slides didn't convince you of the opportunity to buy stocks today, let me try to convince you of why you should still just stick with what you've had. We talked about bonds and the fact that they rarely go down as much as they have but that's simply because we started at a much lower interest rate and we saw the Fed raise rates more aggressively. But where we are today is we think we're near the peak of where interest rates are going. If you look at the 10 year, it peaked out so far this year, a little over 350. It's now around 3.3. We think it's gonna kind of hover around here. That means from here towards the end of the year, if you don't have the 10 year yield go from 330 to 430 or 5%, which would be a dramatic move, you can't nearly have as much pain in bonds going forward. And now that interest rates are higher, bond managers are buying bonds that have a much higher coupon and you're making more money, which starts to heal the price that has declined. Bonds are a self-healing asset class. Over time, they will heal themselves through the coupon. And your expected return in whether you own a single bond or a bond portfolio is your yield to maturity. The only way you can make more money in bonds is to have a higher yielding environment or a higher yielding investment. And it, it doesn't feel good to go through the pain when interest rates readjust, but just know over the next decade, you're actually going to make more money in bonds than you would have at much lower interest rates. On the equity side, we know that sticking with your investment makes all the difference in the world. And that's what this chart represents here. And by the way, I only have one chart after this. I know I'm going a little long. This is just showing what would be the effect of getting spooked and selling out of your investments. Well, if you were just invested in the S&P 500 over the last 20 years consistently, you didn't take your money out, a $10,000 investment turned into $61,685. It's this first bar. That equates to a 9.52% return. But what if you miss the 10, just the 10 best days of the market? That nearly cut your return in half, just 10 days. And remember, there's over 5,000 days in 20 years. Just missing 10 cuts your return in half. And you may say, well, what are the odds of me missing 10 days? And they're actually, or the 10, best days. And they're actually really good because of what's in this box. Seven of the best 10 days occurred within two weeks of the 10 worst days. And more often than not, 
they followed the worst day. So effectively, if one of those worst days occurred, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back, and you had to just get your money out of the market, what is the likelihood you're going to be feeling good enough to get back in within the next two weeks when likely one of those best days is going to occur? Very, very slim. And it's why people who experience that end up doing so much more poorly over time. And they falsely believe it's because they didn't choose the right investments. Unfortunately, I threw in the wrong slide there. Let me find it real quick. The slide I'm looking for shows you over time, if you were to have invested in a knee-jerk fashion, here we go, and you allowed the market to dictate whether you stayed in or not, you would have been the orange bar at the bottom of this chart. This is going back the same 20 years, and this is done by a third-party company called Dalbar that looks at thousands and thousands of investor accounts and tracks them. The average investor earned 3.8% annually, not much better than inflation and much worse than even a very conservative 40% stock, 60% bond portfolio would have done. I like to call this the, the dude hold my beer chart because every redneck video on YouTube that starts or the, the, where somebody's about to do something incredibly stupid usually starts with somebody saying, dude, hold my beer, I got this. And this is investors doing the same thing, saying, I got this, I know when to get out, I know when to get in. That's what crushes returns. It's not picking, it's not missing out on the Apples and the Googles and the Teslas of the world. If you just look at a 60-40 portfolio, again, you did markedly better. So let me stop right there. I covered a lot of information. I apologize for the length, but I, I really went through what I have been getting asked most. And the one final thing I'll say before you pick up the phone, if things continue to be bumpy, which I believe they will throughout the summer. The reason I believe they will is because going back to the very top here, you're going to see that we're going to need months worth of confirmation before we know where we're at with inflation. We're going to need to see these numbers here month after month throughout the summer before we really get a feel for what direction things are going to go. Until we get that confirmation, we don't know what the Fed's going to do, if they're going to have to raise more or less. And the market's just going to be guessing. And so it's going to be driven purely by emotion. And so I say strap in. We may have seen the worst. We may not. I don't know. It may get worse. It may not. But I know it's still a good opportunity to buy. And I know that my investment time horizon is not the next three days or three weeks or three months, but potentially the next three years or more.